Which one do you suggest um, if you want to take a trademark? So the lesson I learned there was that cheap is expensive and expensive is cheap. We always make mistake when we select that category, right? If you, I'm sure most people listening are aware of what a sales funnel is. How do you get that email listing? There are so many things that go into launching a product. Yeah, but that's a very good point that you, you mentioned. Ecom Squeezed Podcast. Welcome to Ecom Squeezed. I am a host, Sebastian, founder of Retail Outsource. Today we have Ben Leonard on the show. He is the founder of Beast Gear, exited that business, and he is the co-founder of Ecom Brokers. Ben have an extensive experience in building brands and making impactful business decisions. He is also the author of Quit Stalling and Build Your Brand. Please welcome Ben Leonard to the show. Hey, it's me. Hi, Ben. Great, great. So Ben, uh, you have done it all, right? So you have built a brand, you have scaled it, you have exited it. So you have done, gone through all the, the way from the bottom till exiting, right? So you have a lot of experience, but I want to focus on the building the brand on this um, uh, episode. So uh, let's assume that I already have a, uh, some products in mind. I have done the market research. I know what audience to target. What? you know your take on it what should i do next sure yeah well it's interesting you say that you know you know what more or less what you want to sell you know who your audience is i think let, let's start there on who your audience is so i like to encourage people to build a brand around an audience who they are familiar with ideally who they are a member of themselves because it's so much easier to develop products and develop your branding and market your brand when you understand who your audience is and what they want and what fires them up because you are a member of that audience yourself. So for argument's sake, let's say you wanted to develop a brand around the niche of, well, I just went for a run this morning. So let's say running. Mm -hmm. I got a few clients who have running brands. Well, if you're passionate about that, suddenly you understand how to communicate with those people. Okay. That said, you don't have to do it now. I also know people, I have clients who have built brands around topics that they're not that passionate about. They're more passionate about in the, the business nuts and bolts what's it behind the brand but mm -hmm. if you're going to do that you really have to do the work to deeply understand your audience and that might mean bringing someone into your audience into your organization who is a member of that audience or consulting with people in that space thought leaders in that industry to really make sure that you you understand who you're dealing with and then coming back to your question then when you deeply understand your audience from there you can understand how to develop products that are going to solve problems for them and are going to be valuable to them in the context of your industry or your niche, and then how to market to them. Because it's no good just developing products and launching them and saying, hey, buy my stuff. You have to deliver value to the people who you're trying to get in front of, let's say buyers in this case. And when you do that, they're going to know, like, and trust your brand, and may even, maybe even you as the face of your brand, and then they're going to be much more likely to want to buy from you. That's great. That's great. Yeah, this is uh, keep on repeating from other sellers as well. I mean, other owners that I spoke with, they keep on saying the same thing. You need to know what you're selling. You need to have deep knowledge about it. And to follow up on the question, you know, regarding the trademark in the UK, we have a few ways, right? It's quite easy if you want to do it by your own. And we have agencies um, that you can, that they can do the trademark for you. You know, it, I want to uh, know your take on this. Um, which one is the safer one? Which one do you suggest um, if you want to take a trademark? Which part should uh, you select? Yeah, here's a fun exercise. Uh, if, if you're at your computer now, uh, go to uh, ipo.gov.uk. It's the Intellectual Property Office. Yeah and search beast gear that was the name of my first brand it still is the name of that brand but i don't own it anymore yeah and it's funny because uh you'll find a few examples of trademarks and the first example is from 2016 and if you look at it and you you actually dig into that trademark and look at the classes that it's protecting mm -hmm. and you you look within those classes it's not a good trademark and it's not a good trademark because i did it myself so back in 2016, I was, I knew I needed to trademark my brand yeah. and I listened to the uh, people who gave me poor advice on the Facebook groups that I was in at the time. And the advice was, Hey, you can save yourself a load of money and do this yourself for a few hundred pounds. And so I did. And I was very smug when I got my trademark registered. But about a year later, I was getting some free advice from an intellectual property lawyer at the local library. And he looked at my trademark and said, uh, you've had a lucky escape. This is weak. It's poor. It's not properly protecting the brand because the depth 
and comprehensiveness of the, the trademark protection that I had submitted myself was not there. What I should have done was consulted with a professional to have all the possible classes and all the possible uh, subcategories within those classes that I might conceivably want to sell products under the name of Beast Gear with protected. And I didn't because I tried to do myself. So what you'll see there on the intellectual property office website is a year later, the same trademark redone 2017, but way more comprehensive. Yep. And so the lesson I learned there was that cheap is expensive and expensive is cheap. In other words, it pays to invest in getting things right the first time. You'll save yourself a ton of money and a load of headaches down the line. So it's a very long way of saying talk to a professional intellectual property attorney slash lawyer when it comes to anything mm -hmm. related to trademarks or patents or registered designs. Yeah, I can see that on the on the IPO website. So if I, you have like five on that same name and um, from 2006, and I can see the classes as well. Yeah, it's. Uh, 18 and 28, 28, 29, yes. Oh, that's, that's a very good advice. Um, we always make mistakes when we select that category, right? Okay, great. Uh, and the next one, it's the, the naming of the brand. You know, what are mm. things that you suggest? Um, for example, if you take your brand, Beast Gear, right? What make, made you put that name, give that name? Yeah, uh, great question. I'll tell you the story of how I named Beast Gear. And then I'll, I'll kind of contrast that with the name of a new brand that I'm developing. And we can okay. talk about how people could think about developing brand names. So here's how I thought of Beast Gear. Uh, it was summer 2012, long time ago now. Mm -hmm. I was training at CrossFit with some friends. So this is way before I developed the brand. I was still working a day job. And at the end of this training session, one of the guys I was training with said, we beasted it today. And I thought, beasted beast. it. yeah, I was like, well, we beasted it. Yeah, beast, beasted it, beast. Beast Gear, that would be a cool name for a, a brand of, of, of training equipment. And so I did nothing about it, of course. It wasn't okay. until four years later that I started to develop the brand Beast Gear, but I kept that stored in my head. So sometimes a brand name just comes to you and it makes perfect sense as it relates to your niche. Mm -hmm. But other times brand names are fairly meaningless. Look at Google. Now there may be... Yeah some name behind Google or some meaning behind Google that I don't know about and that the 99.9% .9 of the population don't know about. But I suspect it's just kind of an interesting sounding word, either has an obscure meaning or no meaning whatsoever, but it sticks in the, in the, in the head, right? So sometimes a brand name could be quite descriptive. In this mm -hmm. case, you know, with Beast Gear, it's, it's the connotations of, of Beast and Beasting your workout and then gear, it's training gear. It, it kind of it does what it says on the tin, right? It is what it is. And sometimes it's not. So for example, I'm currently developing a brand of baby products and the, the brand name is Tuco, T-U-K-O. Uh, we haven't mm. launched yet, but we will next year. And at first glance, Tuco doesn't really mean anything, but it sounds kind of nice. It rolls off the tongue. It does actually have a meaning. In Swahili, it means mm together or sorted, which I felt was quite okay. nice considering it's, you know, one of the products we're going to launch is a baby carrier. So it's about being together and uh, the practical nature of carrying your baby. So there's lots of different ways to think about it. I actually have a whole teaching module on how to name your brand uh, within my course. Not that I'm trying to kind of pitch the course, but it, it is quite, it can be quite an in-depth kind of process that you have to go through. People worry sometimes, oh, I can't think of a brand name. Well, you don't have to think of it right away. You know, brand names uh, can be can be all sorts of different things. It doesn't have to be descriptive, just like Google's not descriptive. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Means so I have your book uh, with me, and um, on the on the page two ten, you mentioned about um, you know the pre launch, right? right. So mm -hmm. if I want to take the next step, pre launching, right? You mentioned uh, phase one awareness, uh, phase two evaluation, and phase three purchase, and phase four as loyalty. Could you just uh, explain uh, those details, what you meant by that? Yeah, sure. Uh, when we think about these, the, the, these phases, from awareness all the way down to loyalty, uh, if you, I'm sure most people listening are aware of what a sales funnel is. This is the idea that at the top of the funnel, we are generating awareness for our brand. At the bottom of the funnel, a portion of those people who became aware of our brand at the top of the funnel will purchase from us. And in between them becoming aware of, of us and some of them purchasing from us, we want to build up interest, build up their consideration in our products, and finally want them to have enough knowledge about our product and trust in our 
brand that they want to mm. buy from us. And we do that by providing them value. And I'm a huge fan of providing helpful, compelling, engaging, useful, free information to the customer in the form of content. And when I say content, that really can be anything from video to a PDF guide, to a podcast episode, to a book, all sorts of things. For instance, let's, let's talk about the funnel the people are in when they get my book, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's searching on Amazon or Google who doesn't know about me yet, how to uh, build an e-commerce brand. And they find my book, they see it's got some good reviews. This guy seems to know what he's talking about. I'm going to buy it. So at first they just became aware of me from searching. Then the reviews and the, the description of the book and the, 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 uh, the positive blurbs from trusted people in the space perhaps built their consideration. And finally, they were ready to take action and buy the book for a relatively low price, like 15 pounds, 20 bucks, whatever it is. And then they read the book, they absorb the content, and they're like, this guy knows what he's talking about. They go get the free resources that go with the book by following the URL or scanning the QR code. And finally, they take action by buying my course. So that's a funnel. They're moving from awareness at the top, just seeing my book on Amazon, all the way down to loyalty at the bottom where they bought my course and perhaps they're, they're then going to go on to buy other useful things that I provide to them. And anyone can do this with their brand too. So let's suppose you have a brand of paddle boards, right? You're into paddle boarding and you sell paddle boards. Well, you might, people might first become aware of you because you are interviewed on a paddle boarding podcast because you're an authority in the paddle boarding space. And on that podcast, you offer anyone who's listening a free guide into how to improve their river paddle boarding technique this summer. And all they have to do is go to this page to download the PDF. They download the PDF in exchange for the email address. You now start emailing them helpful, compelling, engaging, useful information that improves their lives as it relates to paddleboarding. They start to consume this. They begin to trust the brand and you as authorities in the world of paddleboarding. And eventually they become aware enough and have enough trust in your brand that they're going to buy from you. Now they might not buy, need to buy a new paddleboard, but they might need to buy some of the accessories that you're selling, or indeed they might want to blow, you know, a thousand pounds on a new paddleboard. That's what I'm talking about when it comes to those phases, all the way from awareness down to loyalty. Great, great, great. And regarding, you mentioned about the email, right? So, and you also mentioned something on the book as well regarding getting that email list and you offering like a free a gloves, a boxing gloves, lifetime supply, something like that. You mentioned that on the book, right? Um, Sean was pitching that idea to you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So how do you get that email list? You know, that, that's one of the idea, right? Is there any other methods that we can get that uh, email, you know, we can increase the email list? Yeah, sure. There's, there's a lot of ways to get email addresses. So first of all, we need to think about why do we want email addresses? We want email addresses so we can stay in touch with our customers and our prospective customers, but it's important mm -hmm. that we don't spam them, right? So a hugely popular figure or well-known figure in the marketing space is, is Gary Vaynerchuk. Some people yeah. love him. Some people hate him. I, I quite like him. Um, he wrote a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook, which was really about social media, but we can apply it to all marketing. And what Jab, 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 Right Hook means, it means give, 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 ask. It means we have to give value before we can ask for the sale. So here's what we don't want to do with email addresses. We don't want to spam people every day saying, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Instead, we want to be landing in their inbox every so often, once a week, twice a month, maybe with something helpful and useful, and then occasionally ask for the sale. Okay. How are we going to get those email addresses? Well, in the first instance, if we're selling on our own website, we're going to get email addresses from customers when they buy from us, because they have to put in their email address. But what if they're not ready to buy from us? Well, we have to give them something in exchange for that email address. So potentially we might run a contest and run ads to that contest so that we can get their email address. So coming back to the paddleboarding example, uh, you may get a no brainer offer. So it could be win uh, a bundle of paddleboarding gear worth 5,000 and you run that as an ad to um, people who are interested in paddleboarding, or you may be partner with influencers in the paddleboarding space, perhaps if you don't have an ad budget to get it in front of their audience and people will enter the con contest. If you work using a, a one of these viral contests, the more they share the contest, the more entries they get, the contest goes viral, you grow your email list, somebody wins the contest, you email everybody to say, Dave has won, sorry you didn't win, but here's 20% off our new paddleboard or whatever it might be. Other ways to get email addresses would be, let's say you're selling on a marketplace like Amazon, well, inside of your packaging in an insert or written inside your packaging, you're going to give people a reason to go to a particular place on the internet 
a landing page, for instance, and give you their email address. That could be to sign up for a warranty, or it could be that you're driving them to a page. Like, again, let's come back to this random paddleboard example. Uh, it could be scan this code to watch how to uh, fold your paddleboard away in 15 seconds. Right now, mm -hmm. I know me personally as a paddleboard owner that folding my paddleboard away is a bit of a faff, right? But if I could learn how to do it in 15 seconds, yeah, I'm going to do it. So I'm going to scan the code. And I, I scan the code, I land on this page, and as promised, there's a video showing me how to fold it away in 15 seconds. Great. I've, been, I've received value. And underneath that is a little box that says, get 25% off any paddleboard gear today. Now, not everybody's going to do that, but a portion of people will. And suddenly, I've got that email. There's a ton of different ways to think about it. This requires a little bit of brain power. But once I've got their email address, now I can provide them with all that helpful jab, jab, jab content, and then occasionally mm -hmm. ask for the sale and throw in a right hook. Oh, that's a very good uh, strategy. Thank you. And let's assume that we are on a stage where we have the product idea, right? We have the brand name, we have the, the email list, but we need to validate if that product is good enough. We need to test the product. So is that something that you use that email to test the product like in a free sample or maybe you put in a testers? How do you do that? Good question. Yeah, sure. So before we spend a ton of money buying inventory on a brand new product, we want to know that there's enough demand for it. It depends whether I already have a brand. If I already have a brand and I already have a list of customers who've bought from me before, it's, there's a very easy way to find out. I just ask them. I'll just email the list and be like, guys, you've all bought my paddleboard. If I launched a insert paddleboard accessory here, mm -hmm. would you buy it? Right? I, I could have a vote or I could simply wait for replies to come in and count them up. And based off of that, I'm going to know whether this is a winner or not. But there's other ways I can do this. I can run surveys using sites like PickFu, for example. Uh, there are other um, consumer, uh, consumer service sites out there. Respondent is a really interesting one that people could link, look into. I believe the URL is respondent.io. And then you can use tools online to help you assess trends. So exploding topics is a great one. Google mm -hmm. is a great yeah. one. And of course, the obvious one is Amazon. So I can go to Amazon and I can use tools like Zontools, like Jungle Scout, like Helium 10 to assess the demand for these products, but also to analyze the market. Is this super saturated? Mm -hmm. Is it going to cost me a ton of money to launch into this niche? Do the competitors have, you know, are there competitors out there with not great reviews who I can improve upon? Is there a gap here for me or is this going to be too tough given my budget? That's great. That's great. Um, you know, most of the business, they want to exit at some point, right? Um, they will close down or they exit the business. So ideally, we want to start a plan for that at the starting itself before we have the product, right? So is there any steps that we need to think about, you know, that exit in mind? Sure. Yeah. Look, when I started my first business, I, when I started it, I didn't keep the, the exit in mind. I hadn't learned about that yet. And although I do encourage people to build a business to sell, it, you don't need to think about the exit like right at the start. Like right at the start, you're, it, you're flying by the seat of the pants. It's chaos. It's fun. But you're building the plane while you fly it. But once you kind of got this ship to orbit and things are ticking over, you've got one or two products that are ticking over nicely. You've maybe hired a few people. You've got some, stand, some systems and processes. It's time to take a step back and think about, okay, if I want to sell this for a million, two million, ten million, whatever it might be, in x number of years how does the business need to look in terms of revenue profitability growth growth rate it's about putting yourself into the shoes of the buyer and understanding what they want and that's something so you mentioned uh, at the top of the call about ecom brokers so i co-founded ecom brokers when i sold my first business so we help people plan and execute their exits and so what our job is is to help people do that is to reverse engineer what the exit looks like now sometimes People come to us and they say, I want to sell. And we look at their business and we have to deliver the bad news. And we say, you can't. But the good news is you can after we've done A, B, C, D. Now, it might take us nine months to do that. It might take us 18 months to do that. And other times people come to us and they say, I want to sell. And we say, great, we can do it in three months, six months, whatever it might be. It all depends on how attractive that business is to a potential buyer. And, and you know, we really, really want the, the profit margin to really be, uh, you know, at least half a million um, before it starts to get interesting in the, in the e-commerce world. It's not to say we don't sell smaller because we do, but mm -hmm. it's easier when they're bigger, for sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You're saying that the sales turnover, right? Um, that's great. Um, and regarding, um, you know, let's assume that we have everything in place. Um, we are launching on Amazon. Okay, that's one of the sites that we want to discuss on this call. Can we use the email list as well? And is there any other like social media 
is there anything else you know, from your side that you want to input when launching a product on Amazon? Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many things that go into launching a product on Amazon. Yeah. You mentioned email lists, so let's talk about that. Absolutely, you want to use your email list. People are, people are often afraid to tell their email list that they're on Amazon because they think, oh no, these people will now buy from me on Amazon and then they'll never buy from my website ever again. And they want people to buy from them on their website for obvious reasons, not least they get a better margin. But simply put, Amazon is such a huge opportunity that's where all the eyeballs are. If we can use our email list to help us rank on Amazon, get reviews on Amazon and you know, solidify our position on Amazon, then it's going to help us acquire more customers in the future. And also mm -hmm. plenty of those customers will still go on to buy from us on our website. So absolutely. You want to be using your list. You tell them that you've launched, you're available on Amazon. You, perhaps you have a limited price while you launch. Tell them how to each kind of instructing people to go search for it rather than giving them a link for obvious mm -hmm. reasons to help us with ranking. Um, technically speaking, that's a gray area because you are technically uh, manipulating rank. But if you're just instantly saying, hey, go search on Amazon for this, well, you can make the argument that you're not deliberately affecting rank. You're just telling people to go find it. So yes, use your email list to help you with Amazon. That goes for new brands and established brands. Okay. What's your take on uh, UGC? UGC is vital, absolutely vital. Yeah. Uh, I've been, I've been trying to teach people about UGC since like 2016. In fact, when I sold my first brand, I tried to educate the owner about UGC uh, across oh. all their brands. And it comes as no surprise that that owner is now, uh, famously as Thrasio, I could talk about it's public domain. They're in, they're in a, uh, not a good position because they failed to implement what brand owners like me were trying to teach them. So if you go, if people go check out uh, Instagram.com slash beast UK, that's my old brand. You'll see that there has been no content on, posted on there for years because the new owner has completely abandoned everything that I was doing to make the brand a success, uh, which is why they've crashed the brand. But you'll see that the feed is full of UGC and you, the great thing about UGC is a it's cheap or in many cases free and B it actually works better than professional content because uh, UGC converts better. Why? Because people buy from brands that they can trust and they can trust the brand when they can see social proof that other people like them are using the product. So when people would see other people like them using these gear products, guess what? It converts better than some glossy professional looking photo shoot. That's not to say yep. there's not a place for professional stuff. There absolutely is, but it's about having a balance. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very good point that you, you mentioned. Because I was checking the, the sales history on Helium 10 before this call to be scared, and I can see the decline. So, you know, you know, the founder will always take care of, uh, you know, the brand. You know, it's like their baby, right? So they have yep. given a lot more than the people who buy it. So I can see that, I mean, again and again. It doesn't give that much attention, you know, the, what, whoever is buying it. And on this, uh, the brand, um, what else I want to, you know, for the negative reviews. So, for example, if we get some negative re reviews um, for the product, is there any specific way that uh, to deal with those uh, uh, reviews? It is harder and harder and harder to contact customers on Amazon about reviews these days. Um, Amazon have made it that way, uh, quite frustratingly. If you can find out who left the negative review, and then you can provide them with fantastic customer service, typically in the form of a full refund and a new product and going the extra mile in any other way that you consider to be appropriate, then sometimes that customer will change their review. Uh, you can ask them to change their review. Uh, you're going to get in trouble for that. And I see it happen. People getting their accounts suspended for doing that, but there are ways to phrase your response to them, which might point them in that direction. Just got to be very, very careful. I'm a huge fan of trying to get customers to deal with my brand outside of Amazon so that I can take care of it. That could be in Instagram DMs. It could be in TikTok DMs. It could be on a group or in a forum or in, you know, in email. And when I can deal with it in email, if I have an unhappy customer email me and then I turn the situation around, make them very happy. Now I have a fan for life. And guess what? When I go launch a new product in two months time, I can just go back into my emails, find all the people who have become happy customers and contact them and say, Hey, Dave, I hope you're still getting on well with your product X. We're now launching product Y. Would you like to get it for half price? And guess what? He's going to love to. And that's going to help us launch our products. And these are the little nimble things matter that so many brands ignore. And that's how you win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I completely agree with you. And, you know, I saw one of your videos as well in that you mentioned that you used to send a follow up message, like a text message or video message once the, the buyer have placed yeah. the order. Do you just uh, give us an insight? You know, that's kind of personal touch, right? That's what differentiates yeah, yeah, from the competition. So I built a process. So I used a tool, an automation tool to scrape the customer's phone number from the Shopify checkout when they mm. checked out on our website. And very soon after that, not immediately, 
Oh, and that's on purpose to make it seem natural. They would receive a WhatsApp message, which mentioned their name, very personal, thanking them for their order, and attached to that message was a video of me thanking them for the order. The video I recorded once, I didn't mention their name, but in the written message I mentioned their name. And my team member would do all this. It was partly automated, partly a team member. And so every day, customers buying from our website received these automated videos, and it would blow them away. Like the, this level of um, dedication. And also it gave them an, a channel through which to contact us if they needed help. And mm. this level of going the extra mile really makes a difference. Now on the face of it, you think that doesn't scale. How can that possibly scale? But when it's a, a question of automating it and having a remote team member doing it, we were able to do that even when we were generating $6 million a year in sales. And that's the difference. You know, I call it speedboat marketing. It's this idea of being a nimble boat that can pivot, change direction, change itinerary, do what you want. Whereas the big corporates are their cruise ships or, or shipping, you know, freight ships that take half a day to turn around and they can't change course, they can't change itinerary. They're not very yeah. fast, they're not nimble. And that's how we beat them. That's great, that's great. And I want to ask, you know, you have done it all, right? From the starting to the beginning. Is there any mistake that, you know, there should be a lot? That <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. To keep in mind. Yeah, I made a lot of mistakes, but I also yeah. like, I like to consider that the first business I was speed skier was like my, my business degree. That was my MBA, yeah. right? Okay. And now I'm doing other things as a result of that learning. And I still make mistakes all the time. So, you know, okay, a mistake I made with beast skier. Well, I already mentioned the intellectual property one. I had a lucky yeah. escape there. Uh, another mistake was I chose to take the brand into the Middle East and Australia about one year oh. before I sold it. I should have gone into the US instead. And I believe that for only about 25% extra effort, I probably would have four or five X to the business. So I think instead of the business doing $6 million a year when I sold it, we would have been doing more like $25 a million a year when I sold it for not significantly more effort. And you know, we live in a world where people like to measure how quote unquote good they are by whether they're a six figure, seven figure, eight figure or, or nine figure seller, which I think is a ridiculous way to gauge it. Cause I know people who claim to be eight figure sellers and you know, they're not yeah. very intelligent. Um, <laughs> you know, I could have been well into the eight figures for really not any more talent other than I, I would have made one, one better decision. And, and I, I regret that, but you can't live your life like that, right? I might get hit by a bus tomorrow, you know, it's all, it's all part of the learning. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. And regarding the valuation, right? You know, what are the points that will take into account when, when you value a company? Yeah, sure. Again, it comes back to ultimately a company is worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. So what's going to make yeah. a, a buyer want to pay more? So we have this, this model, this framework at Ecom Brokers that we developed called the value pyramid, which is basically how a buyer perceives your business. So right at the bottom, if you imagine like a Mayan pyramid um, with these steps, so the mm -hmm. bottom step is brand. And if you, if you pull brand out, the whole thing's going to fall over, right? So if you don't have a brand and instead you just have a mishmash of stuff that, yeah, is generating profit, but it, it's not cohesive and it makes no sense. You're selling a lawnmower and you're selling, um, you know, a mouse for a computer. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Buyer's not going to want to buy that. Exactly. Okay. Going up the, 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 the pyramid, we've got profitability. The business has got to be profitable. It's got to have a margin of, you know, at least 20, 20%, um, or I say margin, that's going to be your, your adjusted EBITDA, your SDE margin. Um, it, we can sell smaller, like down to sort of 15, um, but that's going to result in a lower valuation, of course, a lower multiple mm -hmm. that a buyer is willing to pay for the business. We want to see growth. So that means historical growth. Um, but also that means, uh, growth into the future. The buyer needs to see, well, what's the opportunity here for me to keep growing this business? That could be that you've got lots of um, uh, products in the pipeline. That could be that there are easy routes to other markets, international markets, or it could be there are easy routes to other channels. For instance, going omni-channel, getting into retail, getting onto Walmart, getting onto your own website, getting onto Fair, getting onto Etsy, whatever it might be. Buyers are going to want to see a moat around your business in the form of intellectual property. That could be the lowest part of that would be sort of just trademarks and then the best would be utility patents and somewhere in the middle of that we got design patents as well and, th and that's a whole other conversation i guess and, and they're going to want to the business is uh, meticulously documented and uh, everything is neat and tidy and organized with systems and processes and it's a well-oiled machine that they can pick up and drop into their own business so that it's easy for them to take off so that's uh, some good points um and we have, we have um, a limit on time, but can you just say, give us some, what made you write this book? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I felt like I had a book inside me and a lot of knowledge to share. Um, yeah, you can see that it, it's quite thick. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. I, I remember the moment I decided to write it. I was uh, sitting at a conference and there was a guy on stage who was uh, casting a spell on the audience. They were eating out of the palm of his hand, but I knew that everything he's saying was 
fairly standard and I'd been doing it for years myself. Uh, and I thought, no, nah, I can do better than this. So I decided to come out of stealth mode and put what I knew about building e-commerce can see what product brands into a book. Oh, that's great. Uh, it is quite uh, valuable. I think most of the people who are selling or building a brand, you know, they have to have a read and there are good points over here. Thank Even you. I learned something new from the book. Uh, great. And do you want to mention something about the, the brokers, the brokers company that you have? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So Econ Brokers, uh, it's at econbrokers.co.uk. Um, so we were founded after I sold my first business. Uh, the brokerage firm I worked with, uh, frankly, was a bit of a disaster. Uh, so my accountants and I tidied up their mess. Uh, so my accountant, Alison, has about 30 years mergers and acquisitions experience, and she owns one of the best e-commerce accounting firms in the UK called Mint Accounting. So we decided to join forces and create Econ Brokers. So I understand brand building. I'm still building brands myself. I understand what it takes to have a successful e-commerce business. Allison sees inside of e-commerce businesses every day in terms of the, the numbers. We joined forces. We have our deal director, John, in, uh, in Chicago for North America. He used to be head of, uh, head of electronics for Amazon Canada and uh, formerly mm -hmm. was at uh, one of the large e-commerce aggregators. So uh, between the three of us, we have kind of the whole ecosystem of e-commerce tied up. And that's why we understand it so well. And, uh, and that's how we can help people plan their exits and then get the deal done. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks a lot um, for coming in, Ben. I'll put the, um, the link of the website, the books, uh, the link to the Amazon uh, down at the show notes. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben, for your time. Really appreciate that. Pleasure. Thanks for having me.